Okay, um, I guess we'll move right along and I'd like to uh, have Dr. Uh, Rami Tadros come up and uh, share with us the results of the TAMBI phase one trial for the treatment of juxtarenal aneurysm. This is another off the shelf system. That's so correct. We'll see. Thank you very much. So uh, the title is a little misleading. Unfortunately, the uh, data for this is still has not been published and is a bit restricted, so I can't really present all the data. But uh, I think this is going to be a very good introduction to the device, uh, another off-the-shelf uh, technology. Again, uh, nothing to disclose. Um, just to kind of review uh, aneurysms and the available technologies today. Um, of course, we've talked plenty about standard EVAR, and we have a lot of great devices for uh, infrarenal aneurysms. FIVAR really comes into play mostly for juxtarenal aneurysms where you have really short necks or uh, if you're right up to the renals. Uh, FIVAR is really good for that. Um, part of the advantage of FIVAR in this situation is really uh, you're covering less aorta, so theoretically you have uh, less risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia. And that's why we just, you know, don't plan to use uh, off-the-shelf thoracic abdominal devices in a you know, straightforward juxtarenal aneurysm where you can treat it with a uh, fenestrated device. Where branched endovascular aneurysm repair comes into play really is for your pararenals uh, your, and your thoracic abdominal aneurysms of, of all extents. So again, pararenal and thoracic abdominal aneurysms. And for those that treat a lot of thoracal abdominal aneurysms uh, with endovascular technologies, uh, we're very, very limited currently in what we have available. So we have to really take what we have on the shelf and tailor it to what we need. Uh, for example, this is a case where we had a thoracal abdominal aneurysm about 10 centimeters. A uh, patient also had a celiac aneurysm. We embolized the splenic artery. You can see this is a VBX out into the hepatic. And we did, the left renal was already occluded, so we did a three vessel. Uh, snorkel with a sandwich, and you know we had a we had a good result initially. Um, this patient was initially symptomatic, became asymptomatic, but six months later, uh, you can t you can see that the proximal neck had uh, dilated. The device had basically slipped down into the large aneurysm, and now you have this large uh, endo leak. So we had to go back, and then uh, you know subsequent reintervention to be able to treat this endo leak, and this is. This pathology, whether you know endovascular or open, is a very difficult pathology to deal with. And so we ended up taking care of this patient, but we had to use less than ideal technology. So there's a clear need for branched endovascular technology. So what is the TAMB device? It's an off-the-shelf thoracoabdominal uh, stent graft. Uh, it has internal uh, branches, uh, unlike the graft that was presented earlier, which had an external branch. Uh, so this has internal branches. It's modular off the shelf. It can be uh, repositioned and constrained, and I'll show how the device uh, gets deployed. Um, for the initial feasibility trial, there were six sites, in including Mount Sinai. Um, and these are the original six sites here. And some of the inclusion criteria, so we're basically the proximal aortic landing zone needs to be 19.5 uh, to 34 millimeters. The proximal seal has to be at least two centimeters. And the distal ceiling zone has to be at, uh, uh, anywhere from eight to 25 millimeters in diameter. Aortic neck angle less than 60, which is pretty typical. Uh, visceral vessels need to be somewhere between four and 12 millimeters. And within the visceral vessel, you have to have around 1.5 centimeters to seal into that. And then the lowest, the lower renal, the lower border of the lower renal artery to where your seal zone is needs to be about 120 uh, millimeters. And then from the lowest renal down to the bifurcation, around 90. And from the lowest renal to the top of the celiac, around 65. And if you have these uh, things, then you can consider using uh, this device. You also have to have a patent left subclavian, and they'll be clear why in, in, a, in a minute. For the for the study, uh, you also ha had to have at least one patent uh, internal iliac artery to minimize the risk of spinal cord ischemia. So the device design. Um, so it, there are. For those who use the uh, iliac branch, it has a, it's, the branch is pre-cannulated. Similar to that, all four of these branches are pre-cannulated uh, prior to uh, introduction into the aneurysm. Um, in order to accomplish that, you need an axillary sheath. Uh, you're going to have a contralateral sheath of smaller diameter, and then you're going to have the main axis sheath uh, to deliver the uh, TAMPI device. 
Um, basically, all four wires are going to be delivered from above, and the device, all of these branches are going to be uh, pre-cannulated. One of the issues when cannulating these from above and you have four wires is the wires can get wrapped. And uh, as a result, Gore has come up with a tri-lumen catheter to, to minimize the wire wrap that could potentially occur when introducing this device. So, the, so this is your pararenal aneurysm. Uh, for the feasibility trial, we basically included all perirenal and type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysms. We excluded uh, type 2 and type 3 thoracoabdominal aneurysms. Uh, for the upcoming pivotal trial, uh, which will hopefully go into effect hopefully within the, uh, the next few months, um, we plan to have a secondary arm for the uh, type 2 and type 3 thoracoabdominals uh, in, in a high-risk uh, arm of the, of the pivotal trial. So, uh, once all the uh, branches are pre-cannulated, the device is introduced, it's initially deployed, it remains partially constrained so that if it needs to be repositioned, it can be repositioned. Uh, once the device is uh, partially deployed, the, each of the uh, visceral branches is then cannulated, being careful, of course, not to lose your wire access into the branches. Uh, once all the viscerals are cannulated, the device can then be fully uh, deployed. Uh, once the device is fully deployed, you have your axillary sheath and you can, sub you can sequentially stent the uh, visceral branches and leaving one of the uh, visceral ports uh, open with the visceral wired already to allow distal aortic perfusion uh, while the device is being, uh, while the deployment is being completed. Once the main body device is uh, fully deployed, that fourth visceral vessel can then be cannulated and stented. Um, so this is what it looks like when it, once it's done. Uh, so you have all four visceral vessels uh, cannulated. Um, this device does not allow for, uh, you know, branching into accessory renals in its current stage. Again, it's an off-the-shelf design, so it can't, it's not customizable. Um, the ballooning of the stent graft occurs above the branches, so there's no uh, issues with collapsing or compressing these uh, stent grafts in this location. The stent that's going to be used here is going to be the Gore VBX stent, which uh, is currently available uh, to us. What, once this whole device is deployed, we actually use the iliac branch component, and that gets deployed within the distal end of the main body, and then from here on, it's like a standard infrarenal aneurysm repair. Um, there's a second configuration, but due to time, I'm not going to go through it, and partly I'm not going to go through it because this is not the design that's going to be um, part of the pivotal trial. Um, the device that's going to be in the pivotal trial is, is the device I described previously where there are four anti-grade ports. Um, the alternate design is a device with uh, two anti-grade ports and two retrograde ports. Um, this, this device is uh, not going to go forward in, in the trial, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. But this is just so an example of it being de deployed in a patient. So the product line here, you have your main body, the thoracoabdominal uh, graft. You have your visceral stents, your IBE component, and then, of course, you can extend that down into your iliacs. This is your VBX stent. Um, this is your trilumen catheter. So this is the finished product. Now, part, partly why we are eliminating the need for the retrograde renal stents is because we have directional catheters that can uh, handle most uh, renal anatomy. So if you have an upward going renal, you can use one of these directional uh, sheaths to uh, cannulate. Uh, these are some of the outcomes and endpoints that will be uh, looked at and will be published hopefully soon in, in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. And this is the patient that we treated here. Um, I actually have two years follow-up on this patient, and I can talk about him freely, uh, where we actually treated a pararenal aneurysm, and uh, currently he's out to two years, doing very well. I saw him actually in the office this past month, and uh, his aneurysm is shrinking, uh, completely asymptomatic, and doing well despite severe heart failure uh, with an EF of 20% and COPD. Um, so basically, the impact of the TAMBI on the future of thoracoabdominal treatment, um, if the trial goes well and we get approval from, for all uh, thoracoabdominal aneurysms, we essentially can hopefully eliminate the need for the majority of these uh, types of procedures where we're doing sandwiches and snorkels or even uh, open thoracoabdominal repairs. Thank you very much.